Hey, procrastinators. Today I have a rather fun collaboration to share with you. Renee from Delaney Jane Cards and I are back to do another fun collab. This time, we created three backgrounds and then we mailed them to each other in a blind swap, meaning we didn't see them until we got them in the mail. In fact, until these videos go live, we still haven't seen each other's completed cards yet, which is kind of a big deal for us because we share completed cards with each other quite often and we bounce ideas off each other a lot. Anyways, how this is going to work is you are going to watch me create these three backgrounds in the first part of my video. I will walk you through how I made them, at least the best I can, because honestly I was playing around with some new products to me that I got for Christmas. Then, the second part of my video, you will see me build the cards that I made with the backgrounds that Renee sent me. After you watch my video, be sure to head over to Renee's channel, Delaney Jane Cards, to watch her video. She will show you how she made the background she sent me and what she did with my backgrounds that you watched me create. The link to her video will be in my description box below. And if you came here from her channel and have never been to my channel before, then welcome! I hope you enjoy what you see. Okay, let's get this crafty party started. For my first background, I decided to do a little watercoloring with the Arteza gouache set that my husband got me for Christmas. Now, the only time I've ever used gouache is to prime my art journal pages before using watercolor crayons or other mediums on them. So I don't really have any experience coloring with this medium at all. I started by using the Hero Arts floral lace dye to cut some contact paper to use as a mask. I saw Christina Werner use contact paper once for a mask for watercoloring, so I thought I would give it a try. If you are going to use something this intricate like this, you need to be extremely careful not to stretch the mask while taking it off the release paper. You can distort the image and it may not lay flat. I managed to be careful enough to not have any issues. Also, be sure to rub it down really well so you don't get any seepage under your mask when you start applying your watercolors. After applying the mask, I used one of my larger brushes to wet the entire piece of watercolor paper. I am using Fabriano Hot Press Watercolor Paper in 140 pound. I chose this paper because it is smooth due to it being hot press watercolor paper. The contact paper mask would stick to it better and have less of a chance of the color seeping underneath. I chose a couple colors of blues and purples to do my watercoloring. One of the blues and one of the purples were pearlescent to make things a little more interesting. In no particular order, the colors I used were pearl purple, iris, lilac, cerulean blue, pearl aqua, and ultramar ultramarine, if I could talk today. <laughs> I started by painting sections of the mask in a pattern that was pleasing to my eye. One thing that I like about using this mask is that you don't have to be extremely accurate. The mask allows you to be a little messy. My hands aren't real steady, so this is perfect for me. Of course, this particular mask has fairly fine lines, so I couldn't go completely willy-nilly, but I did have some wiggle room. I just continued to fill the sections in until everything was filled in. Then I heat set the watercolor paint until it was completely dry. That is pretty important. It doesn't matter if you let it air dry or you heat set it, but it needs to be completely dry before you remove the contact paper mask. When you do remove the mask, you still need to be super careful and go slow. If it starts to rip for some reason, stop and then start removing the mask in the opposite direction. Once I removed the mask, I still had leftover paint on the white palette of my glass media mat. So I took my paintbrush and I started splattering it all over the painting. I love this not only because it uses the leftover paint, but because I just love the look of splatter and I truly love being messy. I had literally took almost everything off my desk and cleaned up alcohol ink splatters off my desk just before filming this video. Well, now it has gouache splatters all over it. My desk will never be splatter free. For my second background, I decided to play with the gouache again, but in a different way. I squirted various colors of yellow, orange, and red onto the side of a piece of Royal Lang Nickel watercolor paper. This is cold press, so it has the normal watercolor paper texture. I didn't care about it having the texture for this technique. Anyways, I squirted the paint onto the side of the paper until I got all the various colors all the way down the side of the paper. Then I took this ruler that I have that has a flat lip on it, but you could e use a large scraper or anything long and flat, and I scraped the paint across my piece of paper. Now, since I have never done this before, I severely misjudged how much paint I was going to need for this, and I only got about halfway across my paper. 
so I had to get out the paints and squirt some more on the side. Problem with this is, is that the paints have already sort of mixed together. So if you try to do this and you make the same mistake, be careful about getting the nozzle of your tube too close to another color. I made a little mess on the ends of some of my tubes and had to stop and wipe them off. No biggie, but just a little annoying. Once I got to the bottom of the paper again, I realized that I maybe should have put some in the middle of the paper just in case I didn't make it all the way across again. So I did all the colors down the middle of the paper too. I kind of wish I had thought about that when I was doing them down the side. It would have saved me time. However, if you have been to my channel before, I think we've established that I am not a pre-planner. I fly by the seat of my pants when making cards. So once I got all the paint on there that I wanted, I scraped my ruler across again. Yay! I had enough paint. I did swipe the ruler across a few more times to get the paint all the way across and looking exactly the way I wanted it, but I knew that there was enough paint at least. I cleaned up my mess and I let this dry. Okay, I lie. I heat set it with a hair dryer on warm because I am impatient to wait for things to air dry. Either way, I got it dry and then I moved on to the next step. Stamping. I pulled out my Concord and Ninth marbled turnabout stamp and I took the alignment guide and I laid it over my background. I am only using this to decide where I want to stamp. Today I'm not going to turn the turnabout. I am only using it as a background stamp and stamping it once. Off screen I covered the background generously in anti-static powder before applying it to my Sizzix sticky grid which was attached to my DIY turnabout jig. I stuck it on there so it would stay in place and be positioned far enough away from the walls of my platform that I could stamp the stamp central on my background. I decided where I wanted to stamp with the alignment guide, laid my stamp on top of it, and I picked it up with my stamp, stamp platform door. Next, I inked up the stamp in Versamark, stamped it, removed the background from the sticky grid, and then covered it in Ranger Gold embossing powder, and I heat set it off screen. For my third and final background, I decided to play with a different medium that I also got for a Christmas gift. I got some Dr. P. H. Martin Hydrus watercolors. I am definitely nowhere near an expert. I wouldn't even classify, classify myself as a beginner here. I'm just someone who likes to tinker with different things. For this background, I envisioned a plume of colors stretching from the bottom left corner to the top right corner. I wanted the flowy, natural look that watercolors get when you do a wet-on-wet -wet technique. So I started by wetting my paper with a large brush. Then I dropped in some color and started spreading it from the bottom left corner to the upper right corner. I started with blue aqua and I kept adding more and more water thinking that maybe it would get more flowy if I kept adding water. At some point I oversaturated or I just didn't tape enough of the edge of my paper down. Not sure which but either way the paper warped and I had a mountain at the top left and a valley at the middle right side of my paper. So all the water started to pool in the, in the valley and you will see me blot that up a few times throughout the painting of this background. After getting enough paint on here to satisfy me for the first coat, I started adding the quinacridone violet. For this one, I mixed the two colors at the edges slightly. Then I would wash off my brush and go back in with just the violet and pull that out a little bit further. This way, it looked almost like I used three colors due to the mixing of the two colors. After I got both colors on and I was fairly happy with them, I heat set the piece. I know that watercolors tend to dry back a little once dry, so I fully intended to do a second coat, but I wanted to heat set in between. Once it was dry, I got to work on doing my second coat, and I just did pretty much the same exact thing, but this time I tried to use a lot less water than I did the first time around. <laughs> I didn't start by using my larger brush to wet the whole piece of paper. I used water on my brush I was painting with and I spritzed it a couple times with my water bottle. Once I was done with the painting, again I heat set. Also again I had leftover paint on my white palette side of my glass media mat. So I once again took my brush and I splattered the colors on the background. I heat set the whole thing again, then I carefully removed the painter's tape folding it back on itself as I removed it. Be sure to go slowly and if for some reason it does start to rip your paper, stop and pull it from the other direction. 
After all that, I still felt like this background needed a little something something. I thought about it for a minute while I was cleaning up my mess, and it came to me. The veining in it reminded me of the veining in alcohol ink paintings, and how you can add foil to those when they are still wet. Well, foil isn't going to stick to watercolor, but you can use glue. So I grabbed my Zig two-way adhesive, any two-way adhesive will work, meaning it has to dry tacky. I carefully drew along the veining of the background. I had to be kind of careful because the nib on my Zig pen isn't very fine tip. There are glue pens out there that do have fine tips, but and even Zig has one, I just didn't have one on hand. Then I let the glue dry. This particular glue goes on blue and dries clear. Once it was dry, I took some scraps of foil, I save all my scraps of foil, and happened to pick out some that are Spellbinders Glimmer Foil that I use with my We Are Memory Keepers foil quill. However, in my experience, it doesn't seem to matter if you use a heat activated foil or a toner activated foil when it comes to applying glue. it with glue. I started to apply a teal foil first along the blue aqua painted areas. Once I was happy with how, it, how much I had there, I started applying a silver holographic faceted foil along the quinacridone violet areas. I used my bone folder to press the foil into the glue. I find that it gives me the best results, but you can use your finger. You will also see me use my finger to rub across the background piece. I am doing this to make sure that I have covered all the glue spots with foil. The glue will be sticky if you haven't covered it, so you can definitely feel if what you haven't covered up, and no one wants a sticky card. Okay, now we're moving on to the backgrounds that Renee sent me. To see what she did with my backgrounds that you just watched me make, you will need to head over to her channel after finishing my video. The link to her video will be in the description box below. For this first ba background, Renee cut the birch press dazzle layer dies out of Michael's recollection 110 pound cardstock. She left them loose for me so I could do what I wanted with them. This way, I could choose not to use all three layers or do whatever I wished with the layers themselves. I have a hard time not using all three layers in dyes like this though, honestly. So I knew I wanted to use all three. However, I wanted to add a little something to at least one of the layers. I thought the white on white was kind of pretty. So I didn't want to add too much to it, as I planned to add some color behind the backgrounds. I finally decided on adding Nouveau Embellishment Mousse in Pure Platinum to the middle layer. This would make it stand apart just slightly from the other two layers and add a little bit of shine. Who doesn't like shine? I set the other two layers aside and I pulled out the embellishment mousse. You will see that I keep saran wrap over the jar and under the lid of my embellishment mousse. I do this for my glitter paste too. I have found that this helps keep my mousses and my paste from drying out. In the past, it seemed like I only got to use them a couple times before they dried out. So now I keep the foil over the top and add saran wrap to protect this from happening. Anyways, back to the card. I scooped a small amount of mousse out with my palette knife and put it onto my glass mat. I immediately closed the jar of my mousse. I wanted the mousse to go on super smoothly and since the mousse is quite thick I gave it one spray with my water sprayer and mixed it in with my palette knife. I then applied it with my Ranger ink blending tool and my DIY blending foams. I have a video on how to make the blending foams with my Cricut Maker. I will link that in the iCards up in the upper right hand corner for anyone that is interested in that. I first applied it with a circular blending motion and then once the background was completely covered I kind of pounced the tool to give it a slight texture. Once done, I immediately cleaned everything up. I don't like to leave any medium like this on my tools. You can wash the blending foams, let them dry, and reuse them. After cleaning up, I very carefully heat set my background because I was too impatient to let it dry naturally. Since there was only a thin layer of the mousse, it didn't even take that long to heat set and probably wouldn't have taken very long to air dry either. When I hold up all three panels, you can see how the middle panel is a little more off-white now. I wish you could see the shine better though. It really is pretty. Next, I glue all three layers to each other with liquid adhesive. It's easy to know which layer goes where with this one. However, if you have never done this before, the die cut with the thickest lines goes on the bottom, the die cut with the medium thickness, or the one that I put the mousse on, is the middle one, 
and the die cut with the thinnest lines is the top one. It's quite simple and once I get them glued together you will see how stunning they looked all stacked on top of each other. For die cuts like these I don't put adhesive on every single bit. I tend to go completely around the edge of it and then I dot some glue in the cross sections. Most glue these days is fairly quick drying so if I went to put glue on every single piece of this the glue that I first put down would probably be mostly dry by the time that I got the rest of it down. Once the glue is apl applied and I want to adhere them together, I start in two corners and line those two up. And then I work my way to the other two corners. So for this one, I started at the bottom and I worked my way up to the top, pressing it down as I went. I do lay some heavy, something heavy on it while it dries. Usually, my stamp platform. However, I cut that out of the video because no one wants to sit here and watch a stamp platform laying on a piece of paper while glue is drying. That would be like watching paint drying or watching the grass grow, right? Then I did the same for the top layer. Glue all around the edge of the die cut and then little dots in between the cross sections. To adhere it to the other two pieces, I laid it on top by lining up the bottom two corners and pressing it down until I reached the top two corners, making sure everything lined up as I went. Next, I cheated a little bit. Instead of creating an ink blended piece, especially for this background, I went digging through my stash box of backgrounds that I haven't used. I have a box of quite a few backgrounds that I have made in either didn't make the cut for specific cards I was making, or were just crafting sessions where I was playing around with new products and wasn't really making anything for a particular card at all. I'm fairly certain that this background was made during my video where I was showing how to make my DIY blending foams, and I just demonstrated how they work towards the end of the video. If that is the case, which I'm pretty sure it is, then the background was made used using distressed inks in dried marigold, mustard seed, and carved pumpkin. I glued the birch press background directly on top of this one, as it already had quite a bit of dimension, with it being three layers of 110 pound cardstock. I thought the yellow and the orange background with this particular die cut made it kind of look like a sunset, since the way that the die is shaped, it almost represents a sun. So with that in mind, I thought a good image to add to it would be a flower. I pulled out a new to me stamp set, the Concord and Ninth Pretty Poppy stamp set, and I stamped it in Gina K Amalgam ink, as I planned to color it with my master's touch alcohol markers. I colored this off screen, not only because this video is already extremely long, but because I'm a very beginner with my alcohol markers. Next I took the thank you sentiment from the same stamp set, pulled out a strip of vellum, covered it in anti-static powder, stamped my sentiment in Versamark ink, offset it to the side of the vellum a little bit, covered it in silver embossing powder, and I heat set it. You have to be really careful when embossing on vellum. Make sure that your heat tool is good and hot before bringing it to the vellum. You also want to keep the heat gun moving. Don't stay in one place too long. Both of these things will help prevent warping. The biggest thing, I think, is make sure that you have a good heat tool, though. When I first started embossing, I had got some powders and a cheapo heat gun on a Craigslist find. To make a long story short, that heat gun was crap. I almost gave up on heat ever heat embossing due to that heat gun. However, I decided to give it one more go and bought the Wagner one that all the YouTubers I was watching at the time raved about. I gave that old heat gun to my husband to use in his garage. He was always borrowing my heat gun to do things. Well, guess what? Now he borrows my Wagner. So, that plan backfired. <laughs> Anyways, back to this card. After I heat embossed my sentiment on the vellum, I attached it to my card, making sure that my sentiment was to the left side where I wanted it. Then I wrapped the vellum around the front to the back side and adhered it to the back with half inch score tape. I did this so that the he adhesive would not show on the front of my card, since vellum can be so tricky with adhesive showing through it. To make sure that I got the vellum strip adhered straight, I used the grid lines on my glass media mat to help me. Remember that poppy I stamped earlier? Not only did I color it off screen, I fussy cut it too. I do have the coordinating dies, however the dies that can't come with it don't cut the stamped image out. They are meant to layer petals on top or cut colored pieces of cardstock to make a dimensional poppy. Fun idea, but not what I was going for here. So I fussy cut my poppy out of this card, which is not my favorite thing to do especially when a flower has such thin parts like the stem on this flower. I managed to get it done though, and I applied my glue to the flower, and then I laid 
it glue side down on my media mat to get some of the excess glue off. Sometimes I will do this to make sure that the glue does not ooze out onto my card when I have something with such delicate details like this flower has. I really did not want the glue getting on my vellum sentiment strip and messing up my card this far into it. Moving on to the inside, I decided to use the other poppy image in the Pretty Poppies stamp set to stamp on the inside of my card. This image is a little different as the stem has a gap in it. It's meant to either stamp one of the couple sentiments included in the stamp set through the stem or you can stamp it laying across the other poppy without masking. That gap fits perfectly if you stamp it in a certain way. Concord and Ninth has a video on the product page. It's quite ingenious. However, that's not the way I wanted to use it. They happen to also include the small piece of the stem to fill in the gap as well. That is how I ended up using the stamp. I first stamped the flower and my sentiment, which also came with the stamp set. The sentiment I chose was, to me, you are as lovely as can be. Then I went back and I carefully lined up the piece that closes off the stem. I honestly can't believe I got it lined up correctly. I mean, it wasn't hard to line up, but I am usually fairly inept at things like this. <laughs> so I chose to stamp the image and the sentiment in black and leave them that way. I like to finish off my cards most of the time, but often leave them fairly simple. I want them to be finished, but I don't want them to steal the show. So the front of the card is definitely part, the part that I spend the most time on, and I don't want the inside to detract from that, but I usually like to put something on the inside too. Plus, the more I put on the inside, the less space I have to write. Honestly, I'm a card maker. I am not a writer. I have a terrible time trying to figure out what to write on the inside of cards I send. Anyone else have that problem? Please tell me I'm not alone. Anyways, I attached the card to my Nina Classic Crest Solar White 110 pound card base. As a finishing touch, I added my Nuvo Aqua Shimmer Pen in glitter gloss over just the flower and the bud. I always shake my Aqua Shimmer Pens before use as the shimmer will settle while they're stored. If you have trouble with the shimmer coming out of your pen, all you have to do is squeeze it a little bit. However, I highly recommend that you do this off to the side and not on your project because if you squeeze it too hard, a burst of that liquid will come out and you might end up with a puddle on your project. Look at all that shimmer. Isn't it gorgeous? For this second card, I pulled out one of the stamps from the Simon Says Stamp Birthday Word Mix 1 stamp set. I had some sentiments previously stamped from this set, and I used one of those, but the other two sentiments that I wanted to use, I had already used and needed to stamp and die cut them with the Word Mix 1 dies. I stamped them in Memento Tuxedo Black ink. I stamped them once, and then I realized that my ink pad was super dry. So I stopped and I re-inked it, and then I stamped it again. I got a much better impression after that. It's amazing how solid stamps will show you how dry your ink pads really are. <laughs> I cut a piece of black cardstock to four and a quarter by five and a half inches, a piece of brick pattern paper from a Recollection Cedar Lodge four and a half by seven inch paper pad to four and a half by five and a quarter inches, and then I cut down the black the background that Renee sent me to three by three and a quarter by five inches. Her background was made from Tim Holtz Metallic Confections cardstock, and she heat embossed the Simon Says Stamp Diamond Pattern Background Stamp with Ranger Gunmetal Embossing Powder. I took three of the sentiments that I chose from the Birthday Mix 1 stamp set, and I lined them on the left side of my card. I looked at them for a minute, and then I decided it was missing something to ground the sentiments. I didn't want to use ribbon. I wanted something that looked a little more masculine in the pattern, and all my ribbon is fairly girly. So I pulled out my Sizzix Tim Holtz Alteration Stitched Rectangle Die Set. In that set, there are two strip dies. They both cut the fun stitched type patterns that the rectangles have in that set, and they both cut straight down the middle of the strip, leaving you with two pieces. I could either butt the pieces together for a thick strip, or use them separately. 
As you can see, I tried both ways and ultimately decided to only use one of the strips. I thought that using both strips was just too thick for the sentiments that I was using. I didn't want something that would overpower the, the sentiments, just something that would ground them a little. Next, I realized all of my sentiments were birthday related, but none actually said happy birthday. So I looked through my stash and finally decided on a set of happy birthday dies from one of my tonic craft kits. This is from number 24. It has both the word and the shadow, which I liked because I could keep with the white and black theme of the other sentiments. I didn't want to just add it floating in space, so I used a circle die from the same kit to mount it on. It was slightly big, but that was no big deal. I just adhered the sentiment to the left and will cut off the portion of the circle that will hang off the card panel. I chose to adhere the three supporting sentiments on the left side down flat to my card instead of popping them up. I didn't want a ton of dimension on this card. With all the layers, it's a bit thick already. Plus, the circle part will be popped up. So, I glued the black strip onto the card, centered down the first set of diamond plating. The middle of the first set of X's on the left side, if you will. Next, I took the sentiment that I planned to put on top of the card and then adhered it. Then I adhered the bottom sentiment. I did this so I could evenly space out my sentiments easier. I can better eyeball where the center senti sentiment needs to go if my top and bottom sentiments are already in place. After those sentiments were adhered, I decided where I wanted to put my main happy birthday sentiment and laid it on the card. I flipped over my card panel and I cut off the bit of the circle that was hanging off. I did this before adding the foam tape and adhering it because I find it easier to cut the excess off when it is flat to the card panel rather than, rather than trying to make sure I get a clean cut when this piece is raised off my card panel. Once I got it trimmed up, I applied my foam, ta foam tape and I adhered the piece to my panel. Moving on to the inside of my card, I took the other half of that black strip that I didn't use on the front of the card and I glued it to the left side of the inside of the card. I cut down the pieces that stuck out past the edges of my card base. Then I went back to the Simon Says Stamp Birthday Mix 1 sentiments that I stamped earlier and I picked out another sentiment. This time one with the white background and black text. I also die cut one of the smaller rectangles from the Sizzix Tim Holtz Alteration Stitched Rectangle Dies set that would fit the sentiment widthwise. Next, I took the sentiment and the die and I lined it up to figure out where I needed to cut the die cut to make it fit my sentiment. I lined it up and I, to fit the sentiment, but I also lined up the die to fit into the stitched edges of the die cut paper that I previously cut. You will feel your metal die kind of fit into place in those grooves of the paper. This, this is pretty important to make sure that your die cut cuts correctly and doesn't look funny. You want the die to line up with what, your previ what you previously cut. Mine wasn't exactly perfect. It might have shifted in the machine, but it wasn't off enough to be extremely noticeable, so I left it. I adhered the sentiment to the black matting piece, and then I adhered that to the card base. To finish off the card, I adhered my card panel to my Nina Classic Crest Solar White 110 pound card base. For my third and final card, I started by stamping a few of the foliage and feather stamps from Altenew's Happy Dreams stamp set with a Kaleida Color Spectrum Rainbow ink pad. When using this ink pad, it, is, it has a little slider to push the colors together or spread them apart. I didn't show this in the video and I probably should have. You store the pad with the ink spread apart. When you go to use it, you want to slide it so that the inks are touching each other. Then. When I was inking up my images, I did a slight shimmy back and forth across my stamps. Just a very, very small movement back and forth. I wasn't looking, looking to muddy up the images or my ink pad, but I did want to slightly blend the colors and not have harsh lines. I tried to position the images so that the colors wouldn't be this, in the same order on each matching foliage piece. I also stamped each image twice, although I don't show it in the video, and I didn't quite use all the pieces on this card. After stamping them, I die cut them with the coordinating dies. Once I got all the images die cut, I played with how I wanted them placed for quite some time off screen. 
I had this picture in my head of them being a whimsical edge type piece laying on the side of a piece of vellum to separate them from the background piece, which I know I haven't shown yet. The background piece is very colorful and busy. It's gorgeous, but I needed something to separate it from this very colorful and busy piece that I was adding to it. I saved this background until last because it was so pretty that I almost didn't want to cut into it. I was afraid that I would mess it up. I have this fear of cutting into pretty things. It's probably why, no, I know it's why, I have so much pattern paper that I hoard away. Anyways, I pre-folded my vellum around my card base so that I knew exactly where I could lay these pieces and that they would fit onto my card base. Then I got these laid out the way that I wanted them and I took a picture with my phone and had it laying off to the side when I turned on the camera and got ready to adhere these down. I adhered two foliage pieces to each large foliage piece and then I adhered them down to the vellum flat. Next I adhered the top feather down with foam tape and I took the bottom feather and only put foam tape on the bottom of it and put liquid adhesive on the top of it as I wanted to lay it partially over the top feather. Once everything was adhered to my vellum piece, I adhered it to the background that Renee made. She used deco foil transfer gel through a chic style stencil by Gina Marie Designs. After the transfer gel was dry, she applied the deco foil rainbow shattered glass foil over the top. Say that three times fast. Anyways, again, just like the first card, I used half inch score tape to adhere this piece to my card panel. I didn't have to worry about getting it on straight this time because I had already done all that off screen when I pre-folded the edges of the vellum. So I just needed to get those edges with the folded marks lined up right and I was good to go. Moving on to the sentiment for the front of the card. I chose the sentiment, follow your dreams, from the same stamp set. I grabbed a piece of black cardstock from the, my scrap bin and I treated it with anti-static powder. I stamped the sentiment in Versamark ink, covered it in Ranger White embossing powder, and I heat set it. Once that was smooth and melted, I took a circle die from the Spellbinders Nestability Standard Circles Large Set and I die cut out the sentiment. Moving on to the inside of the card, I took the feather stamp that I used on the front of the card and a sentiment from the same stamp set that says, the distance between dreams and reality is called action. I stamped both of these using that same Kaleidicolor Spectrum Rainbow ink pad that I used for the images on the front. To attach my card front to my card base, I chose to use score tape this time. It was slightly warped from the foiling process. I feel more comfortable using score tape when my card fronts are slightly warped. If I don't, sometimes the liquid glue comes up a little around the edges. So I applied my score tape around the edges and put liquid glue in the middle. When I use dry adhesive like this, I like to remove the backing paper just a little bit and fold it over giving me a small handle and only exposing the tape in each corner of my panel. This way, I only have to fight with the corners if I happen to apply my card front on Crooked, which happens more than I care to admit. And you can see I did some adjusting on this one. Once I get the card panel to my liking, I will pull each backing paper handle off and press the card panel down, adhering it fully to my card base. Once my card panel was adhered to my card base, I chose to adhere my sentiment to my card front flat to the card. I already had the feathers popped up, plus the sentiment was rather large and I had to tuck it into the feathers a bit, so popping it up would have made it tricky unless I wanted to cut part of the circle off like I did with my last card. I didn't want to do that with this one, so I chose to keep it flat on the card. To finish it off, I brought out my Nuvo Aqua Shimmer pen in glitter gloss and covered the feathers and the foliage with it. I will caution you that using this type of product over dye-based ink is risky business. I was quick and light-handed with it. If you aren't careful, it will cause your inks to bleed. I don't know about you, but I think this was my favorite card of the three cards. Let me know down in the comments which one was your favorite. I hope that you enjoyed this fun collaboration Renee and I did today. I know we both had so much fun doing this. Let us know what you think about this, and don't forget if you haven't already, go check out her video. The link is in my description box below. If you enjoyed my video today, please give me a thumbs up, and if you haven't already, I sure would appreciate it if you subscribed to my channel. As always, have a great day!